AEW Executive Vice President Cody Rhodes recently caused a bit of a stir when he began attempting to trademark former WCW event names once owned by WWE after they acquired the company in 2001. Cody stated that he filed trademarks for things like Bash at the Beach, Super Brawl and Slamboree, terms that WWE's legal eagles had failed to realize had expired in an attempt to annoy WWE into giving him the rights to the Starcade name. And with good reason, because before it became a middling WWE Network special, Starcade existed between 1983 and 2000 as the premier NWA slash WCW event and was created by Cody's father, Hall of Famer, the American Dream Dusty Rhodes. Starcade was a Thanksgiving and then Christmas tradition that featured WCW's biggest matches and was usually used as a platform to end major long-term rivalries. Like any wrestling event that was held across 17 years and seeing countless bookers at the helm, previous Starcades have witnessed some of the best matches of all time, along with some of the most bonkers and more dodgy decision making than your faithful host during high school. Will we see a revived Starcade one day in AEW's future? Time will tell. But for now, I'm Adam Pachiti from Cultaholic.com and this is every Starcade ranked from worst to best. Join us. Oh, and by the way, it doesn't include those crappy WWE Network specials. On with the list. Number 18, 1994. Hulk Hogan rightfully receives credit for the part he played in reviving WCW's fortunes during the mid-90s. Hogan piqued interest when he arrived in 94 and then completely turned the business on its head when he was revealed as the third member of the New World Order in 1996. For all the positives, however, the Hulkster's presence was by no means unproblematic. One of wrestling's utmost backstage politicians Hogan used his influence to get jobs for his mates like Jim Duggan, John Tenter, and best pal Brutus the Barber Beefcake, also known as Brother Brutide, the Zodiac, the Disciple, the Booty Man, the Man with No Name, and on this night, the Butcher. While Big Booty Brutai was a memorable WWE character in the coke fueled 1980s, he had absolutely no business headlining the biggest WCW show of 1994 in what was quite obviously a case of egomania running wild. Hogan won the match and retained the WCW heavyweight title as if there was any question as to the outcome. A low point in WCW's history, the match was pants but still managed to not be the worst thing on the show. That dubious honor belongs to the contest, if you want to call it that, between Kevin Sullivan and Mr. T. Yes, Mr. T. And I pity the fool that decided to book such absolute twaddle on this show. WCW standout Sting was in action in the semi-main event, battling Avalanche, aka Hogan's mate Tenta, using another natural disaster sobriquet. Clocking in at 15 minutes and featuring ref bumps, run-ins, and a disqualification finish, this was overlong and overbooked, but inoffensive in the context of this particular show. Elsewhere, Jim Duggan had a decent scrap with Vader over the US title, NXT dad Jean-Paul Levesque, at that point a rookie, wrestled fellow new starter and everyone's favorite dancing German, Alex right, Johnny B. Bad took on Arn Anderson for the TV title, and the Nasty Boys, oh gee, look, it's more of Hogan's mates, defeated Harlem Heat. Number 17, 1991. It's the Lethal Lottery! Yeah! For anyone unfamiliar with the concept, please don't get too excited. This is really just a standard lottery for a tag team tournament, with the teams drawn honestly 100% totally at random, the ones that won their tag matches that evening going on to enter into the Battle Bowl Battle Royal main event, where they would be a one-man winner. Sound convoluted? Welcome to WCW country, baby! An interesting idea, the Lethal Lottery slash Battle Bowl meant that two heels and faces or feuding wrestlers could be drawn together as a team, leading to matches not likely to take place on regular TV. While nice in theory and a good way to continue various rivalries, it was not so enthralling in execution. Unless matches like Michael Hayes and Tracy Smothers versus Jimmy Garvin and Marcus Alexander not quite buff Bagwell, or Dustin Rhodes and Ricky Morton versus Larry's Bisco and Ellie Gonte are your sort of thing, in which case please go ahead and either watch this show or see a therapist. None of the tag team matches were particularly very good and the Battle Bowl main event was, at nearly half an hour long, a bit of a slog. But at least the fans were into the finish between Sting and Luger and pop big for the Stinger's victory. Number 16, 1999. By the time Starcade 99 rolled around, it was clear that WCW was perhaps not long for this world. Months of mismanagement had resulted in massive losses for the company, which was well into the red and suffering an identity crisis on a creative level. With Eric Bischoff having been relieved of his duties, WCW had recently brought in former WWE head writer Vince Russo and his colleague Ed Ferrara, two men that had been credited with helping turn WWE's fortune around during the Monday Night 
War, their brand of envelope pushing entertainment seen as critical to the success of the Attitude Era. Off the leash and without Vince McMahon and other WWE execs there as a filter, Russo quickly got to work with the swerves, nonsensical turns, work shoots, and everything on a pole matches. The product of the quality already on a downswing tumbled. For the supposedly biggest show of the year, Vinnie Roo and the boys presented a supercard chock full of everything that was driving fans away from the promotion in their droves. Highlights include Medusa beating Evan Courageous for the Cruiserweight title in about three minutes, making me wonder if all of those Rey Mysterio, Eddie Guerrero, and Dean Malenko matches actually happened. There was also Steve Dr. Death Williams, fresh from being knocked out by Bart Gunn in the Brawl for All, taking on Vampiro. Accompanied by the Misfits, Vampiro defeated Dr. Death and then took on his manager Oklahoma, aka Ed Ferrara, doing an incredibly insulting Jim Ross impersonation. And also Disco Inferno teaming with Lash LaRue to take on the Mamelukes, Big Vito and Johnny the Bull. And that is just the undercard. Your alleged main events may have had star power, but nothing came close to saving this shambles of a show. Lex Luger vs Sting, Kevin Nash vs Sid in a powerbomb match, and a WCW World Title match pitting Bret Hart against Goldberg, which, while not half bad, isn't enjoyable due to the groan-inducing references to Montreal and career-ending injuries suffered by the hitman on that kick. Number 15, 1997. Many things can be blamed for the collapse and eventual death of WCW, but the rot really started to set in at Starcade 1997. After building to a huge showdown between Sting and Hollywood Hulk Hogan for the best part of 18 months, the match itself was a huge letdown with a messed up finish, the consequence of backstage politics and a lack of long-term vision. In an ideal world, Sting, whom fans had been dying to see take down the Hulkster and the rest of the NWO, should have rolled through Hogan like a superhero shrugging him off before making him tap like a little hot dog skinned bitch. In the nightmare world of WCW, what actually happened was a tedious match with a weird ending. To recap, Hogan hit Sting with Stinger's bat, big booted and leg dropped him, Nick Patrick performing a fast count and supposedly screwing Sting and the fans out of their big moments. However, Patrick performed a normal paced count, supposedly at the behest of one Mr. Terry Bollea, thus making it look like a legitimate victory. Bret Hart, stationed at ringside and not not about to let another so-called screw job go down on his watch, refused to have the match end and threw Hogan back inside where Sting promptly finished him off with the Scorpion Deathlock. The Bulls that main event wasn't the only thing preventing Starcade 97, WCW's highest grossing pay-per-view ever by the way, from reaching its potential. In a night of blow-off matches, to the annoyance of the fans, the heels mostly went over on the undercard. Of the rest of the matches, Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko's Cruiserweight title opener was good, but then those two were allergic to having bad matches, and Perry Sanders and Chris Benoit had an energetic Raven's Rules showdown. Raven was supposed to be the Crippler's opponent, but was sidelined with a case of appendicitis. WCW continued to advertise him anyway, because of course they did. Elsewhere, Buff Bagwell took on Lex Luger, DDP faced Kurt Hennig, and Larry Zbysko, astonishingly one of WCW's most over babyfaces at the time, collided with Eric Bischoff in a match that was never in danger of being decent, but managed to pass into fast territory with ease. Number 14, 1984. Starcade 1984 was all about the featured Ric Flair versus Dusty Rose. An epic rivalry that lasted for years, the Nature Boy vs the Son of a Plumber was a worthy headliner and helped sell out the Greensboro Coliseum, compelling hundreds of thousands more to watch on closed circuit television. What a shame then that the match itself was so disappointing, clocking in at around 12 minutes, barely a warm up for Flair in the 80s, and had a terrible finish, a WCW trademark that saw special guest referee and boxing legend Smokin' Joe stop the match due to Dusty Rhodes bleeding. Not to discount the size of the cut, but this is Dusty Rhodes, a man who probably sprang more of a gusher in a strong wind. Luckily for Flair, Dusty, WCW, and the fans, the two men would have a chance at redemption the next year, but more on that later. Elsewhere on the show, Ricky Steamboat and Tully Blanchard had an underrated classic for the US title, Ron Bass and Dick Slater beat the tar out of each other over the Mid-Atlantic title, and Manny Fernandez and Black Bart fought over the World Brass Knuckles title, a real name for a real belt that actually existed. The rest is an acquired taste and likely hard to get into without the context of the storylines of the day. Number 13, 1987. Starcade 1987 is mainly talked about today because Vince It's Just Business Pal McMahon tried to mess with the NWA's big night by programming the first ever Survivor Series on the same day and then forcing the cable companies to choose which one they wanted to carry. Considering WrestleMania 3 had broken a bazillion records earlier in the year, you can probably guess which way most of them decided to vote. Starcade 87 was further hampered by disruptions to the planned main event between Ric Flair and Magnum TA. 
The charismatic Tom Selleck lookalike was due to win the world championship that night until fate intervened. Magnum was involved in a career-ending car accident a month before the show, necessitating a new creative direction. Enter Ronnie Garvin, a decent enough wrestler but no real substitute for TA, and a serious disappointment to the fans. By the time Starcade came around, Garvin had won the NWA world title from Flair, and the two would go on to main event the company's biggest show of the year inside a steel cage. Their match was okay, but Garvin's short time reign led to a drop in business, resulting in Flair winning the match and regaining the belt. Elsewhere, there are perfectly watchable matches between Dusty and Luger in a cage, Arn and Tully and the Road Warriors for the NWA tag titles, and Nikita Koloff and Terry Taylor for the NWA UWF TV title. Watchable but unexceptional, a simple way of summing up this whole show. Number 12, 1990. Ric Flair was also tasked with main eventing Starcade 1990, although you wouldn't know it because he was wrestling under a bodysuit and mask as the infamous Black Scorpion. Typically, Flair and opponent Sting could have tremendous matches at will, but Slick Rick was unable to wrestle his usual style here in order to keep up the pretense of the gimmick. As such, the match suffered, and it wasn't helped by the presence of other dummy Black Scorpions or Flair coming out of some sort of bizarre space pod for his entrance. The whole presentation was about 10 notches below the cheesiest of 80s B-movies and symptomatic of WCW's problems at the time. The show did boast a couple of really good matches, however, including Lex Luger tackling Stan Hansen in a bull rope match and Doom facing horseman Barry Windham and Arn Anderson in a tag team title street fight. The rest of the card mainly comprised matches from the Pat O'Connor Memorial International Tag Team Tournament, which was eventually won by everyone's favourite liberty takers, the Steiner Brothers. Number 11, 1993. After a couple of years away from WCW due to a brief but memorable stint up north, Ric Flair returned to WCW in 93 and finished the year out by once again headlining WCW's flagship show. That wasn't Plan A, which originally had WCW World Heavyweight Champion Vader putting the gold on the line against softball enthusiast Sid Vicious. After Sid went scissor happy on Arn Anderson during an international tour, WCW management scrapped that idea, fired Sid and made plans to have Flair take his place. The resulting match was very good indeed. The drama intensified because of the stipulation that Flair's career would also be at stake. The pure emotion and storytelling carried this one, capped off with a very popular win for hometown boy Flair. Further down the card, Steve Austin and Dustin Rhodes had a canny two out of three falls contest over the US title, and William Regal and Ricky Steamboat demonstrated their technical mastery over the TV title. And if you ever wanted an example of WCW's thought process when it comes to laying out matches, note that they gave the tag team title match between the Nasty Boys and Sting and Road Warrior Hawk 30 actual minutes. I'm convinced that that match is still going on. Number 10, 1989. Nobody loved a tournament more than the NWA slash WCW, so it should come as no surprise that for Starcade 89, they decided to run two massive ones on the same night. The two tournaments were to be round-robin style affairs, with the four biggest single stars and the four biggest tag teams all competing against one another. On the singles side, you had Flair, Sting, Luger, and the Great Muta. For tag teams, it was the Steiners, Doom, the Road Warriors, and the Wild Samoans. The point system, 20 for a pin or submission, 15 for a countout, 10 for a DQ, etc., forced viewers to pay attention and gave the event a real sports feel, something the group did well in a bid to distinguish themselves from the entertainment-oriented WWE. Though some of the finishes were, as usual, suspect, Starcade 1989 was a grand showcase for some of WCW's top stars. Match of the Night honors went to the main event and the tournament decider between Flair and Sting. Sting came out on top because WCW just couldn't get enough of the neon-painted sensation and was actually congratulated by four Horseman members after the fact. I'm sure that alliance lasted long. Number 9, 1998. Like many major WCW events from this era, it's much better to watch them today. That way, it's easier not to get annoyed at the booking or obvious politicking. Watched through rose-tinted glasses, Starcade 1998 is a fun piece of nostalgia with some good matches and a boatload of star power. Though WWE were quite noticeably top dog at this point in the war, WCW weren't yet completely out of their mind and knew how to build to a big show. Oh no, actually, scratch that, WCW were actually starting to 
to lose their marbles, as evidenced by the finish to the main event. In it, undefeated World Heavyweight Champion Goldberg defended against Kevin Nash, his reign and streak coming to a questionable end thanks to Scott Hall and a cattle prod. The win somewhat surprisingly got a huge pop from the fans in Washington, but this is definitely one of those moments that appear on the long list of things that helped kill WCW. If the show had a poor ending, it had a great start though, kicking off with a dynamite triple threat cruiserweight title match between Juventu Guerrera, Rey Mysterio and Billy Kidman. That blistering pace setter was immediately followed by Kidman taking on Eddie Guerrero in another fast paced thriller, Kidman winning both contests in an attempt to make him a star. Other top matches include The Giant, better known to you and I as The Big Show, going one on one with Diamond Dallas Page in a surprisingly good match with a great finish. And Ric Flair took on WCW head honcho Eric Bischoff in a match that was fueled by intensity stemming from real life issues between the two. Though not a great wrestling match in the Flair Sting or Flair Steamboat or Flair Luger or Flair Broomstick category, Nature Against Easy E is entertaining in its own way. No prizes for guessing who went over between the former 13 time at that point world champion or the boss. Number 8, 2000. Not far from WCW's dirt nap now, Starcade 2000 proving to be the last in the company's history as Vince McMahon, owner of the mum and pop WWE operation, would soon finally vanquish that evil billionaire Ted Turner once and for all, buying WCW and winning the war for good. Come on, Vince. That is what actually happened, and if you don't believe me, check out any WWE produced documentary on the matter. Despite being on the verge of an old yellering, WCW shockingly managed to piece together an entertaining show for the few remaining long-suffering fans that they had left. That in and of itself is remarkable given the streak of hot garbage the company had been churning out for a long time, and the backstage turmoil that engulfed the group on a daily basis. Things once again got off to a good start thanks to the dependable cruiserweights, this time the Young Dragons, Three Count, Shane Helms and Shannon Moore, and Jamie Noble and Evan Courageous, who had a ladder match for a future shot at Chavo Guerrero's cruiserweight title. Why it started as a standard tag match is anyone's guess, but it's probably better for your sanity not to question what WCW were doing at this point and just appreciate the breathtaking spot fest that these six put on. Later on, the middle-aged and crazy Terry Funk had a zany hardcore match with the long-forgotten Crowbar, one of the several matches on the show that turned out better than it probably had any right to. Also in that bracket is a Harris Twins and Jeff Jarrett vs Filthy Animals six-man tag and a Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare vs Kevin Nash and DDP effort that actually had, well, effort. You can live without seeing Seeing Goldberg taking on Lex, I clearly can't be asked to really earn these millions of dollars I'm getting per year Luger, but you should stick around for the Scott Steiner Sid Vicious WCW title main event, a worthy entry in the lunatic meatheads beating the crap out of each other genre. Number 7, 1986. Number 7 on our countdown is Starcade 1986, Night of the Skywalkers. No, that doesn't mean there was a cameo from Luke and the Boys, because WCW would never be stupid enough to insert a fictional movie character into a major show like this, right? The Skywalkers moniker came from the Road Warriors vs Midnight Express scaffold match, which saw both teams and their managers crawling around on a plank above the ring, the unfortunate Jim Cornette inevitably falling off and knackering his knees in the process. Other gimmicky goodness came courtesy of Dusty Rhodes vs Tully Blanchard in an NWA TV title first blood match, a hair vs hair match between Paul Jones and Jimmy Valiant, an Indian strap match between Wahoo McDaniel and Rick Rude, an NWA world tag team title cage match between the Rock and Roll Express and the Andersons, and Louisville Street Fight pairing Big Bubba Rogers and Ron Garvin, the secret love child of Greg Valentine and Ric Flair. Speaking of, the Nature Boy was once more in the main event of the show, defending the NWA heavyweight title against Nick Kita Koloff. The wrestling's not the best judged by today's standards, but the characters, stipulation matches, and big event feel make this one worth your while. Number 6, 1995. It's the World Cup of Wrestling! Another year, another tournament for WCW. The World Cup of Wrestling was not so much the World Cup, but rather WCW versus New Japan Pro Wrestling stretched over seven matches. The appearance of wrestlers from New Japan Pro Wrestling and the us against them aspect gave the event a different flavour to other arcades before and after. It also resulted in some pretty bloody good matches with Jushin Thunder Liger, Koji Kanemoto, Shinjiro Otani, Masahiro Chono, Masa Saito and Kensuke Sasaki showcasing a style of wrestling that was perhaps unfamiliar to American audiences. Just remember the year before Starcade had been headlined by Hogan and Ed Friggin Leslie. The Japanese stars meshed well with WCW representatives Eddie Guerrero, Alex Wright, Chris Benoit, Lex Luger, Randy Savage, Johnny B. Bad.
Chad and Sting. The pick of the bunch being Liger vs Benoit, Guerrero vs Atani, and Kanemoto vs Wright. WCW won the series 4-3, you didn't really think that those other guys were going over, did you? But that wasn't the end of the show. Closing things out was a triple threat match between Sting, Luger, and Ric Flair, with the winner receiving an immediate shot at Randy Savage's WCW title. Though not quite matching the excitement of the tournament matches, you can't really go wrong with that combination of talents. Flair won the triple threat and then the world title to put a bow on a great night for wrestling and international relations. Number 5, 1988. The first WCW pay-per-view after Jim Crockett Promotions was bought out by Turner, Starcade 88 True Grit was a grand show from a company with a point to prove. The feature attraction was the NWA World Heavyweight title match between, who else, Ric Flair and Lex Luger. A huge blow-off after a solid year of the total package feuding with Flair and the rest of the four horsemen. A 30-minute epic, this one should dispel any rumours that Luger wasn't a top performer in his day. He may have become lazy and lost interest towards the end of his career, but at this time, in this setting, it's easy to see why there was so much hope for him. Elsewhere, there was a fine tag match pitting the Road Warriors against Sting and Dusty Rhodes, a Barry Windham Bam Bam Bigelow US title match, and a World TV title match between Rick Steiner and Mike Rotunda. Earlier on in the show, I'm seeing double four Midnight Expresses, as the original team of Dennis Condry and Randy Rose took on Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane. Sumptuous Southern Wrestling 101. The strength of the matches and the variety of wrestling styles sees Starcade 1988 land at number 5 on our list. Number 4, 1992. 1992 saw the return of the Lethal Lottery and Battle Bowl, though this time it proved to be more successful as WCW reduced the number of teams and kept the overall quality higher. The randomness of the teams and the various combinations of matchups make the tag matches a lot of fun, but none compared to the non-Lethal Lottery tag team title match between Barry Windham and Brian Pillman and Ricky Steamboat and Shane Douglas. If you're looking at those four names and thinking, one of those is not quite like the other, you should know that in between being a dynamic dude and a dickhead Dean, the franchise was a true talent, more than doing his fair share in a match with three other excellent wrestlers. Everyone worked hard here to produce an underrated classic that deserves a lot more love than it currently gets. However, love was in short supply in the King of Cable, no, I have no idea what it means either, tournament final between Sting and Vader, the two legends holding nothing back in a long and stiff match that was pretty much the best American pro wrestling of the era. This is the Vader that was feared and respected and one day needs to go into the WWE Hall of Fame. Two world title matches, an NWA title match between Masahiro Chono and Great Muta, and a WCW title match between Ron Simmons and Steve Williams were a little underwhelming and the show's pacing is as inconsistent as WWE's writing, but the show itself is well worth your time and attention. Number 3, 1996. A common theme during the NWO era of WCW is that their television and pay-per-view output had great undercards filled with long great wrestling matches and their main events were taken up by the old boys who saw the company as a way to stay on top and work a slower than usual pace, all while collecting a large salary courtesy of ATM Eric. That is certainly the case at Starcade 96, as the young up-and-comers provided the goods from bell to bell during the first half of the show and the established stars, mainly ex-WWE guys, flexed and stalled and punched and kicked for the second. In that magnificent first half is a stirring WCW Cruiserweight title match between Dean Malenko and Ultimo Dragon, a WCW Women's title final between Medusa and Akira Hakotu, a legit dream match between Jushin Thunder Liger and Rey Mysterio, and a slick effort from Jeff Jarrett and Chris Benoit. All great stuff that highlights just how exciting and cutting edge the product was at the time. Further on up the card and pay scale, the outsiders ran into the faces of fear, the truly terrible terrifying combination of Meng and the Barbarian, and the Giant squared up with Lex Luger in a heated match where Luger, one of WCW's main protagonists against the New World Order, was over as he was muscular. And boy, was he muscles. The main event between Roddy Piper and Hulk Hogan made up for a lack of thrilling action with emotion and a very invested audience. Piper was the ultra-popular winner that night, leaving the ring as WCW champion after overcoming the, no, no, scratch that, the match was actually non-title, something WCW 
WCW neglected to mention beforehand an egregious example of the old bait and switch. That regrettable act of audience manipulation aside, Starcade 96 is a solid show and does enough to come in at number three on our countdown. Number two, 1983. The first Starcade is very nearly the best, but comes in just behind at number two on our list. Titled A Flair for the Gold, the inaugural event was all about Ric Flair challenging the NWA's resident hard man, the late great Harley Race. Their cage match was made after Race put a bounty on Flair's wrestling career, leading to Bob Orton and Dick Slater injuring him with a spike pile driver and sending the dirtiest player in the game off to the retirement home. Obviously, that retirement didn't stick. Flair would continue to wrestle for the next quarter of a century or so, and who says he's done yet, as the alimony pony came out of his retirement to challenge Race for the pounds of gold. Their big blow-off was probably a slower pace than most modern fans would probably enjoy, but the match is full of violence and everything is logical. It's a great example of an old-school title match, and you can practically smell the cigarette smoke and beer as you watch it. Other big matches on tap are a brutal dog collar match between Roddy Piper and Greg Valentine, a match that allegedly caused the rowdy one to suffer permanent hearing loss in one ear, a textbook world tag team title match between the Briscoes and Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood, and a sleeper of a great tag outing featuring Jay's brother Mark and Wahoo McDaniel fighting it out with Slater and Orton. Put aside a fairly forgettable undercard and focus on these great matches and you will have a lovely time. The first supercard as we know them today, it's no wonder that Vince McMahon would come calling for Race, Orton, Steamboat, Valentine and Piper in the not too distant future. Number 1, 1985. Coming in at number 1 is Starcade 1985, The Gathering. And if WrestleMania can be held in multiple venues on the same day, as was the case with Mania 2, why not Starcade? WCW's granddaddy of them all was held in both Greenboro, North Carolina and Atlanta, Georgia, each city having its own card and designated main event, with the closed circuit feed cutting back and forth between the two. This worked remarkably well when you consider the technology of the time, and better still, the action was mostly brilliant with the show offering several classic matches. After stinking out the joint in 84, Flair and Starcade creator Dusty Rhodes were offered another crack of the whip in 85 and managed to have a match much more befitting their talents and rivalry. Dusty finally prevailed in a bloody and intense war, capturing the world title to the jubilation of everyone in the Omni, only to have the decision reversed the next week because the original referee, not the one that counted the pin, was knocked out. Never change WCW. Never, ever change. A match designed to have a proper decisive ending was the big grudge match between Magnum TA and Tully Blanchard. Not only was the match taking place inside a steel cage, but it was also being contested under I Quit rules. Full of rage and hatred and violence and blood and drama, this is one match that every fan owes it to themselves to see. The finish with Magnum ramming a wooden spike into Tully's eye was extreme for the time and a worthy end to one of wrestling's great rivalries. Other highlights include another cage match, this time an end WA tag title match between the Rock and Roll Express and the Koloffs, an Atlanta street fight between the Midnight Express and Jimmy Valiant and Miss Atlanta Lively, Ronnie Garvin in drag, don't ask, and the best Abdullah the Butcher match, yes, that is a thing, you're ever going to see, as the scarred up, gross out artists clash with Manny Fernandez in an oddly compelling Mexican death match. There is a whole lot more to be enjoyed by watching Starcade 85, but don't just listen to me ramble on and on about it, go and check it out and you tell me if it's not the best Starcade pay-per-view ever.